And so, you know, growing up, my dad, I think, you know, there's a couple families that stayed over there, but uh, through effort and time, that community has um, kind of retained its, its sovereignty there on a small reservation, and it's just a very small group of people. My wife actually happens to be enrolled there, which is a little unique because it's hard to be enrolled there. There's just such, literally there were seven people, seven people there in 1934 when the federal government made a roll. That group of people and their descendants are enrollable basically <coughs> at Shoalwater Bay. So the vast majority of Chinooks living in the Bay don't uh, come down from those folks and don't have that same status. But, you know, just to say at Shoalwater Bay is always acknowledged Chinook fully. I mean, this little reservation group of people, whatever, have always acknowledged the rest of our community as being who we are. And when they can, they've provided us uh, nice things. I mean, for instance, there was a time before I moved to Grand Round where all of our health care was covered by those folks. As long as you lived in Pacific County, they were giving us health care because they had the means to access the federal funding. So, so while Sam said there's really not a big a base exactly, we don't have a land base, a reservation. Uh, we do have, I mean, Willapaw Bay really is kind of the heart of us at this point. I mean, there are hundreds of Chinooks living in Willapaw Bay, and that, for that, we're very proud. <coughs> say, say, that's the reason why Sam was born there and the reason I was born there and what have you. And as noted in these 1851 treaties, there was a, a assertion or a belief that we were going to, you know, we were all to move there to Willapaw Bay, and that was going to be our reservation. And so, you know, besides people moving there anyway because of pressures on the lower Columbia River, uh, you know, people move there. A few places like Clatsop Plain and Pillar Rock, a few communities, Altoona Dahlia, what have you, they you know, maintained a, a good, strong Native uh, presence. And, you know, so some folks moved earlier than not. My grandmother <coughs> or my great-grandma, my dad's grandma was born at Pillar Rock and lived there through uh, you know the early part of the 1900s, very early parts, and then and then moved into Willapaw Bay, where my grandpa was born at Bay Center. So you know there's a, a continuous move kind of into the bay and to those places uh, for all the Chinook people of the Lower Columbia River until very recently. Now there's kind of a move out because uh, we did have status in many ways, the land that we lived on in Shoalwater Bay or Willapa Bay in Bay Center was most often Indian trust land. You know, the federal government acknowledged us as Indians and when they came around surveying, whatever, they were giving us these pieces of land that we were living on. Our family's land at Pillar Rock was Indian trust land too. So while it wasn't a reservation with a contiguous boundary, these were individual par you know, parcels of Indian trust land. Um, Bay Center at one time, you know, probably the majority of the land there was uh, Indian Trust land. So we have always kind of existed as a recognized group of people, but just without the formality of a treaty or, you know, it's been an interesting uh, existence that we've had. So we've had to go to Indian schools. We've hunted, as fish, uh, hunted and fished as Indians. Uh, in fact, you know, just as a way of showing the closeness and time to this sort of the revolution, as we'll say today, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, it was only 1983 that my family lost our rights to fish as Indians. So, you know, I was a young man. <coughs> as a young guy, we always signed our fish tickets as Indians when we fished. So this is all new history. A lot of people want to look at Indian history and just say sort of like, get over it. You know, like, just get over this, and it's a long time ago. Well, you know, I'm going to say that in my experience and everybody I know's experience here, this is not old history. You know, this is uh, stuff that we have lived with and continue to live with today. So with that said, I was asked to talk about, uh, about education and education philosophies. The thing that's here is just a small example of that and we'll kind of flip through it and I'm sorry to say I put this up in uh, Chinook Wawa so we have the same bit of curriculum in Chinook 
but the fonts aren't loaded on this computer, which is, of course, I didn't think about ahead of time. <laughs> All my computers have these fonts on it, so. <laughs> so, so we had to put it into English. No, not all. But so this will be the English one, and it's just an example of something that we'll show you. And this, this is actually the fruition of a lot of, uh, of work. But going back to teachings from my dad and, you know, that we heard, uh, there were, and, and you know, Sam said these longhouses were the universities of the, of you know, uh, this place for ten thousand years or more before, and this is the truth. And there were entire philosophies about how to live uh, built around just these houses, because you had in some cases 30 and 40 and 50 people living in a single house. You know, there was an entire way of living, how to interact with people, expectations, what have you, that were built into these homes. Uh, likewise, uh, canoes. You know, we are really <coughs> fond of our canoes and use our canoes all the time now, but there's an entire way of interacting with people and an education associated with it just in, in the canoes. You know, the way that you have to carry yourself, the way that you have to, you know, interact with people, perform whatever in that situation. Around our wintertime and our religion, there's an entire way of life that, you know, is taught around that. Even something as simple as people think of it as a game. We have a game called Ishlakuma. Has anybody ever heard of stick game or bone game? So it's called, we call it Ishlakuma. But Ishlakuma, there's literally basically a secret society. I mean, there's a group of people that live by a whole, you know, an entire way of living just associated with that game, you know? And you can also think of other things locally like the whale hunting that we weren't really big participants in but not very far north and a lot of our relatives, whatever. There's an absolute way of life associated with that. Or the Kukwali, is another, uh, another, you know, basically entire set of, you know, educational philosophy. I'm just, I'm just trying to say this is, you know, there were numerous ways that our elders were teaching our kids. And in a way, it's an, an acknowledgement of taboos. I think, you know, people have asked before, like, how do you describe a Chinook or what's a Chinook or what have you? And I would just say that we have laws or taboos or, you know, protocols that were just absolutely built into us. And if you follow those rules and you're a believer in those taboos, then that's what makes you a Chinook. You know, more than anything else, not blood, not, you know, because all of our ancestors intermarried with other tribes, that's what we did. We never wanted to marry people with any perceived relation to ourselves. It's actually miraculous in a funny way to have my wife and I be able to get married because for somebody, you know, for two families living in Bay Center, it's very unusual to be able to trace back before the treaties and not have any relationship at all. It's very unusual. So, you know, that's a good thing for me, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, it's unique. And so our ancestors, like I'm saying here, was totally compelled to not marry anybody that you could have any perceived relationship to. So we were always marrying to Chehalis or Tillamook. Uh, you know, our, my family's part Tillamook. There, Sats up. I named that man <coughs> Urbane or O that killed uh, John McLaughlin Jr. Well, he was a uh, Odawa uh, Métis guy from the Hudson Bay Company. You know, I mean, he was an employee of the Hudson Bay Company. In fact, the Fort, the 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 jail at Fort Vancouver was built for him. So it's <laughs> kind of something to know. John McLaughlin was very unhappy with this whole scene here that happened.